Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for bra braving the weather to come out to uh, hear this, uh, what I, I know is going to be a very informative uh, presentation by Shu. Uh, my name is Guy Caruso. I'm with the uh, Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, and we're uh, really pleased to have uh, Shu with us, uh, both uh, a key leader of the Institute of World uh, Economics and Politics in Beijing, as well as the uh, Center, as uh, well as the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, CAS, which we have, uh, have, have had a strong relationship between CAS and uh, CSIS for a number of years. So uh, we're really pleased that Shu could be with us. He has uh, been one of the leading researchers in energy and economics in China for a number of years. And I uh, met him while I was at the IEA and uh, been, been active in the International Association for Energy Economics and a number of other organizations. And uh, spent, I believe, what, 26 years at the CNPC, China National Petroleum Con Corporation, and, and for the last, uh, I guess it's about four years now, at the Academy. And one of the things that, uh, that he and his team have been working on is this Chinese energy, uh, energy outlook, uh, which was, is the first publication uh, of its kind from the Academy. And uh, Xu mentioned to me that they work very closely with the International Energy Agency in terms of uh, the methodology and the formatting. So I, I probably a little early to be uh, claiming that, that maybe this would be the Chinese version of the World Energy Outlook. But anyway, it's the beginning. And I think we're all going to uh, benefit from uh, hearing from Xu this, uh, this afternoon. And uh, we'll have about a 30-minute presentation, then we'll go into Q&A. And uh, so we're very pleased that uh, Shu has chosen to make this the uh, inaugural presentation of this publication uh, here in the United States. And it came all the way from uh, Beijing just to, to be with us today. And so we really appreciate having just come back from uh, from Japan, I know how you must feel. <laughs> I mean, just arrived yesterday. So, uh, Shu, thank you very much for being here and for uh, the, all the good work you have done at the Academy. And we're going to uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. And by the way, the uh, extensive set of PowerPoint slides that uh, Shu will present today, it will be available on, on the uh, website as of tomorrow. So, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, my friend, Mr. Guy Crusoe, for your introduction. Actually, uh, this time, to be honest, is not a good time for me to, to speak here because my bike clock <laughs> remains Beijing time, <laughs> not uh, DC time. But uh, I'm very happy and excited to be here invited by CSIS, Guy Crusoe, and uh, uh, his colleagues. Today, I really would like to, how to down this one, make my presentation about my report in form of, entitled by the uh, World Energy China Outlook. I may a uh, little bit uh, to uh, make a brief introduction of the book. First of all, the book is an independent book done by myself and my team member independently. The conclusions, the data are calculated by ourselves. Some findings should be different from others. And uh, this book, I will show you here is uh, in, fortunately in Chinese, not in English. But 
The English exact summary is available from the any here. I provided here. English version of exact summary is good. It's bilingual, so English version is here. But in terms of the whole book, it's uh, uh, composed by two parts. Number one is world and chance from Chinese perspectives. And the number two is uh, energy security from multinational, uh, multidimensional perspectives. Uh, according, uh, 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 addition to the two parts, the main body of the book, we have a very well researched introduction, introduced and explain the nature, the approach, assumptions of our research. And also we have a database to support our research. And before I uh, unfolding my speech on the main points of the research, I would like to say a few words about the title. Because the title, uh, both in Chinese and English, leaves this change to, uh, to the audience. Because it is not a, a world energy outlook. It's not things like Chinese energy outlook. It's a combination. It's a combination interactive outlook focus on China, but uh, we look at China from world perspectives, vice versa as well, simply because we have a strong uh, source behind the title. That is energy issue in China today are worlds, vice versa as well. So when we look at China, we should have a broad view, global view, to look at China, what's happening in China, and the implications on the world as well. And today, when, when we travel abroad, we hear a lot of people talk about China, India, when we deal with energy issues and others. So China thinks not only a black box or black swan to the Westerners, even for us as well, because it is not easy to be understood well from conventional wisdom. So we should have a keeping brand mind to look at the China. So that's why we need to put the two things together to have an interactive look at the China to see what's happening in China. Try to have a better understanding of the country and its relation with the rest of the world. So Currently, World Energy Outlook by IEA or International Energy Outlook by the EIA and some others similarly put by the energy company or China Energy Outlook, we can find a dozen copies in China, cannot be explained a lot of things. That's why we will work on the issues, we're working on this, this report. And we have uh, our own approach as well but similar to some existing reports you know, focusing on policy, policy-oriented, because we find the policy issue is an important issue, is uh, the human factors in addition to market competition, population, technology, some other issues. Policy issue will be number one thing important to affect the energy development into the future. So we developed our own approaches, learn something from the others. And our approach is uh, entitled by ECHO or ECHO's Logical Friendly Energy Strategy. This strategy is very well researched. Before we conduct our research of this topic here, because we find the existing energy policy here in China, seemingly covering all things, all aspects we discussed. But uh, some, we still not satisfied. Even for example, lots of topical issues are covered, like uh, security of supply, which is important to the energy consumer like China, uh, production at home and abroad. It's important for the country to go abroad 
for the energy resources, energy saving, structure changing, green and low carbon growth, technological and systematic innovations. All things are covered by the existing policies. But however, such policies fail to satisfy ecological human expectations simply because of fact they are designed to show the state interest, to show the ec economic growth or GDP growth only, to show the domestic uh, priorities mainly. That's the, the issues come from. And we have uh, several critics on the existing energy policies, including but not limited to the following eight points here. For example, energy policy are not systematically matched. Some policy focus on energy production, while others focus on energy use, serving or serving on a single sector or subsectors. Policy constraints on energy utilization and efficiency are weak. Energy policy in China are short of effective supervision and enforcement. Some many policies are equivocal. Some policies are not in line with those issued by the central because of conflict or interests. Some government policies are kidnapped by energy groups, energy big companies. This is almost obvious because of a small body of the energy regulators in China. And last is the transparency, accountability, and supervisions are questioned. So with all these things in mind, we think we should review the energy strategy and find out what we should be emphasized, what prioritize of the new energy policy should have. We list the three things here should be important. Number one, which new energy policy should focus on ecological systems and secure harmonious uh, functioning of its parts in order to build up an ecosystem instead of economic growth or GDP growth merely. To make sure human base or human needs should be served and as a core content of the energy policy. And also, we find the energy source in China should be multiple and coexistence. And also, we have uh, independent chapters on this issue, the future of the energy for China and for all the world will be look like something different from the past. Some major energy source may not easily replaced by others. So coexistence of the multiple sources of energy is fitting our realities and the future when being utilized in cleaner, efficient way. So we have our own central scenario approach to our research. That is, uh, again, is the eco-friendly energy strategies. It's as our uh, essential approach uh, to support our uh, report here. And again, we have a database to support it. And this database is very much uh, uh, structured accordingly based on our understanding and research on the energy policies, as I mentioned above. So we also have a, a set of assumptions displaying uh, some, uh, some, some factors we should can take into account. First of all, GDP and the population is the main driving force behind, and the market, especially pricing, is important. And plus, subsidies should be calculated in China and also technologies, including CO2 emission reduction technology and other technologies. I have some uh, data for this. Uh, technology is very important, of course. We list uh, uh, 10 technologies, which is very uh, critical, important to, to calculate uh, the energy development 
here in China, but not well assessed, to be honest, for the first, uh, first version or research here. But uh, later on, we will very much focus on technologies and the implications on energy. And the last thing is the policy. Again, it is policy, uh, energy policy in China should be not only focused on a national interests, public policy dimension should be factored in as, as well. So this is uh, important for us to keep in mind as well. And the main finding, again, we have almost 15 main findings uh, from our research. I have no time to go through each of them, of course. So instead, I select the eight of them to have uh, more discussion with the audience here. Number one is make chance. Make chance focus on uh, our global views, you know, uh, especially energy transformations. For example, convention, we believe conventional patterns of energy utilization are about to terminate it. Hydrocarbon views should be coexist, uh, not being uh, replaced one another continuously. And uh, natural gas and renewable energy sources should be drawn these forces to, to glow on the stage to reflect the higher human expectations and environment requirements. This is uh, very important for China and for the world as well. When we look at the, the, the energy revolution, energy transformation into the future, we have uh, uh, studies on the issues and just skip this one. And uh, structurally speaking or geologically speaking, we uh, agree to some point made by the IEA, especially under it's a new policy scenarios. Energy will be increased steadily into the future for the different type of energy source, especially for natural gas and renewables. And for a fifth scenario is a, a separate one, you know, less a more constraints on the growth. Uh, but the natural gas and the renewable were facing some uh, bigger pressures, you know, to be grown up at the faster rate. And of course, China and India will take a big pie, almost half of the new energy consumptions during our uh, outlook period of times. China, India, if we take uh, Middle East into account, will be more than half. So this is an important uh, message. And uh, our uh, forecast of, uh, on Chinese energy demand growth will be going up like in the same routes as REA, but uh, at uh, a much higher growing rate than the REA. So China will be take a lead. And also India, Middle East, uh, and uh, Brazil will be followed. Comparatively speaking, OECD country consumption will be very flat. So the demand in demand side is things moving from developing world to the emerging regions. Geologically speaking, it things is moving from the Western Hemisphere to Eastern Hemisphere. So it's uh, eastbound demand is obvious. And in supply side, of course, Energy dependent, independence here in U.S. is reality. And uh, someone say a uh, new Middle East will be formed if taking to uh, Canada, U.S. or North America together will be play a very important uh, role in the 2020 oil, at least oil in North America will be account for 25% uh, of the world total output. This is a reality, but this is the one part of the story, I believe. We should look at the existing Middle East, Persian Gulf especially, and outside of the Middle East as well. Together with the new Middle Eastern, the three Middle Easterns will present much uh, close, closely 
closer issues, close to realities, both for oil and the gas as well. These two slides I bought from the IEA just represent how important of the Middle East into the future, long term, long term to, to come until the 2030 or 35. So my conclusion from these observations is following. The supply is not only diversified, but also uh, polycentric as well. So Middle East, of course, will play in, continue playing an important role, especially if we look at the Iraq. This country will be growing up not only for oil, but for gas as well, just second to Saudi Arabia. And some other supply centers will play an important role, for example, uh, Eastern Africa, and some other places I just uh, uh, cited here. So the uh, polycentric supply is obvious against uh, the eastern bound, eastern bound, uh, eastern bound uh, demand as well. And the natural gas present the same case, but it's more particular presents the uh, polycentric, and plus, because of the changing of the supply and landscape for natural gas in some years to come, for example, 2018, the things trade pattern will be reshaped. If you take a look at these slides here, some other source from different places to Asia. So we believe in the few years to come, the buyer's competition will be reshaped. We're determined to the sales competitions. This will be uh, new things and have great uh, repercussions on the competition structure and the pricing as well. We should closely look at that and uh, especially what is the meaning to China. And the second point is Chinese demand. Chinese demand, we have forecast on the energy demand into the future. The, our approach is all, uh, trajectory of the demand growth look like this. It's simply seen from the chance is growing at much higher growing rates than IEAs, 2.23% for the energy uh, consumption grows from now to the 2035. But the important thing is look at the energy mix, especially for coal, will be reduced from somewhere around the 70% decreased to the level below the 50%. This is our view. And, uh, observations, analysis of policy issues in China and uh, what's the changing into the future. And the power generation presents a similar change as uh, we just showed for the energy consumption. Again, for the power generation, the coal will be reduced sharply as well. Natural gas, as IEA report uh, indicated, we are now entering the golden age of the gas. We think this is true, not only for the world, but for China as well. But uh, look at China closely. The golden age in China will be represented much in much more detail and a little bit different way we have seen from the IEA's report. Simply speaking, unconventional will play a very important role to support the golden age of gas in China. We present these slides here. We have uh, the data from IEA on China. It seems the chances look like similar, but uh, if we look at the unconventional, IEA take, IEA uh, as according to definition, all the unconventional, they including three types. Uh, 
tight gas, CBM, and the shell. We take a same uh, definition, but uh, our calculation is much different, especially for the 2011. Our calculation for the unconventional, especially including tide gas, will be around 40%, not 10%, simply because for many years, tide gas calculate as part of conventional. But now, especially we use the same definition, takes the tide gas out of conventional to be a part of unconventional, the, 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 the production of unconventional total will be much in much higher rate. So around the 40%, this is our realities. Actually meaning we have we have, we have, relatively speaking, the mature development experience in this uh, development, uh, in, in this uh, unconventional, especially for tight gas. We have technology, we have experience to develop our tight gas, but not uh, for shell, not for shell. So far, shell production in China is very limited. Our number for last year is 200, 200, 200 million cubic meters. Very small, very small number. This is the things we should uh, closely look at. Even the number, the potential, resources potential for shale gas is huge, even larger than US. But the production is extremely low, simply because we have no history and experience to develop the shale gas compared with US, which have almost 200 years from now. But it's a very short time here in China. So this is the issue. So putting the things together, we believe unconventional will take a very important role. We'll be driving force for the golden age of gas here in China, but mainly for by uh, are promoted by the tight gas and the CBM at this year's and some years to come before the 2020. So after the 2020, I believe we'll, the chance will be continue, but uh, left left off a little bit, you know, but continue to go to the year 2035, and uh, at that year, unconventional rate still will be uh, seven. 3%. So the reality is that China entering golden age of gas, but the uh, driving force behind is unconventional. For the year before the 2020, mainly come from tide gas and the CBM. So for sure, we believe we still lack of experience. Even we have similar technologies, for example, uh, uh, horizontal drilling, we have similar technologies, but uh, it means different things. Even we have such type of uh, technology, but uh, we cannot to develop the shell uh, quickly, uh, simply because we still uh, need to, to develop a, a geological theory to have better understanding what the specific structure look like here in China and what's the technology package should be required, and what's the business module infrastructure should be uh, in place, plus regulations as well. Now, all the things not uh, very ready. This is my views on the shale gas here. Renewable, renewable, globally speaking, this is uh, almost everybody all knows things will keep growing. And uh, if we closely look at the China, our projection is different. There's a big gap between our projections and the IEAs, especially uh, for the year 2035. And uh, we believe the renewable or non-fossil fuel in China, the demand in China will be increased to the 15% in 2020, and continue to grow to the 24.5% in the 2035 
from current level a little bit below the 10 percent. And this is uh, uh, similar views for the renewal and conventional, but uh, uh, limited to the power generations. This is present a similar, but much more remarkable uh, changes. Uh, dependence. Because energy demand will be growing and grow at much faster, uh, higher grade rates than uh, IEA, as I forecast, I mentioned. So the falling dependence for, especially for oil and then for gas will be increased. Our number for the oil dependence will be increased from now 55 or a little bit higher in last year to the 60% in the 2015, 65% in the 2030, and even higher or close to the 68 in the 2035. And natural gas dependence will be, and now is the first, first time we have reached one third now, 30% uh, now, and could be 35% in 20, 2015 and 40% in 2020. Before it may be the decline and to the 24% in the year 2035. So the natural gas will be little the different, not going to the same way, same route like, uh, like uh, oil, uh, simply because we still have huge potential, domestic supply potential, resources potential to be, to be tapped. And because of this, uh, energy dependence so will be increased slightly. And uh, take the things into the account. Uh, I believe that the fully dependence will be continue to force the country to expand its uh, energy imports globally in two dimensions. One is bilateral, to continue to strengthen its bilateral relations with neighboring countries in particular and also bilateral as well, to uh, try to uh, set a bi multilateral uh, cooperation framework uh, uh, with other parties to create a good uh, uh, environment, um, protections uh, to seek uh, energy security, not only for itself and uh, for the for, for <coughs> rest of the world as well. This slide I've a little bit skipped. And the emission. This is important uh, issues. And simply because uh, our projections for energy demand uh, into the future, just showing there, and uh, CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 emissions in throughout the outlook period will be increased. But uh, in the year be before the 2020, our projections and our scenario, EEAs, simply uh, put this way, EEAs will be going in the same route, almost same corridor with IEAs under the new policy scenarios and PAs. But the things will be different after the 2020. So the, the, our projection will be higher, of course, than the 450 scenario of IEA, but um, much lower than IEAs and IEA numbers under the MPAs and CPAs, current price scenarios. Because our thinking behind, our consideration behind is that the technology will be played its low, but not uh, unfolded in full, and especially CCAs still in pilot stage, but uh, after 2020, the implications, the, the, the outcomes will be felt, and uh, the uh, industry and the society, society will, be, will be impacted in a good way. So the, our projection will be in low, uh, keep the download. And as well, 450 scenario it's not uh, possible, not possible. And our projection looks like this may reflect 
in some terms, in some way, in reality, we have proceeded. And the most important thing, again, is core. How reduce the core is the number one thing. In the year 2020, we should find any way, anything, any type, find a way to reduce the core simply. May help to in reorganize. We should shut down some small core size, core production size, and have to reorganize the core companies. So anything we can, we should to reduce or remove some coal fire plants in the east, east part, in, in, in some uh, consuming uh, regions. And later on, we should to play uh, uh, technology. The, so the coal will be reduced, uh, emission will be reduced and play a very critical role. And energy security, again, as I mentioned at uh, the beginning, is a special uh, focus. Uh, we look at the energy security for a long time, but our conceptions is, uh, uh, for many years is unconventional, is traditional. That is uh, focused on supply. But now the concept for us is shaped, reshaped. It. Not only we look at the supply for our own needs, we also will take care our own markets as well. We have to keep our markets stable to provide the energy security to producers, exporters as well. We should take care of both supply and demand. And also, simply because we feel the interactions between China and the rest of the world is so real, so important. So cooperation in multilateral or bilateral are important. So cooperation, it should be a part of our security, energy securities. This the issue is very much emphasized, underlined by the leaders and the experts as well. We have more explanation on these issues. And uh, especially for the interactions. We, we take uh, uh, China, Russia, uh, as an example, to explain the, what type of the bilateral cooperation will be developed between China and its neighboring countries. And most importantly, we also focus on multilateral. Because, again, back to the source I just mentioned, energy issues in China are world, vice versa. So we should to take, us, take, uh, take care of the world issue, energy issues as well. To really think about energy governance and the global agendas, especially environment and climate changes. In this part, actually, China is doing its own part to get ready to work with the rest of the world. And uh, we actually advising China in many parts to work with different uh, international, regional and international organizations, including G20, APEC, uh, SM Plus 3, BRIC, and Shanghai Cooperation Organizations. But uh, when China working with existing international organizations like IEA, not become a member, full member, there's no way for China to be a mem full member of IEA, but China is very active to work with them, especially now become part of IEA alliances. Alliances, I guess with uh, the, uh, the other five emerging economy. This is the one thing that reflects Chinese position, Chinese attitudes, uh, how to work with the rest of the world. At the same time, China very very active to work with enabling country and uh, to work with other emerging economies within the framework of the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to share some views on, the, uh, on their own issues and uh, raising their common issues to the international platform like the G20. So this is the Chinese views uh, dealing with the global energy security and how to build up the new type of the global energy systems. So this is the issue just uh, going through very quickly uh, here. So we have some recommendations for, for the country as well. The recommendation is very simple. I put this this way. Number one for China should be curb 
energy consumption by increased energy efficiency for sustainability. And number two is optimize energy mix, which is very important, especially reduce coal, coal consumption for emission reduction. And last thing is enhance energy security system at home and abroad, means not only in country level, national level, but uh, global level as well. So this is, I have to stop here, some main points I just explained and get ready for the question. Thank you. Well, Shu, thank you. Thank you very much for not only a comprehensive presentation of, the, of that very interesting report, but uh, I think uh, some insights into some of the questions that uh, all of us who've been yeah. involved with these outlooks and trying to project the future, you know, I mean, you don't, no matter where you go, whether it's IEA, EIA, or uh, any of the private sector forecasts, China and India, as you mentioned, and other emerging economies are certainly in the forefront, and that certainly was one of the messages that I think uh, your research has indicated. Uh, I think three, there were at least three things that really struck me. Uh, one was um, a much faster rate of economic growth that you foresee in your outlook relative to the IEA, and yet the energy demand was larger, but not nothing like the, the uh, increase that one would have expected with that lar much of a larger, I uh, don't remember the specific numbers, but you were at least two to three mm. two point three. points per mm -hmm. year. Yeah, uh, IEA is 1.9 yeah. So yeah, for China. A, yeah. And the other one was um, the question a lot of us have been asking here is will China, given its resource base on shale, source rock, follow the North American pattern in shale gas? And I think your answer was very clearly no, that the focus on unconventional will be tight gas and CBM, CBM. and some shale gas. But, but yet you have a very impressive growth in the supply of natural gas that leads to a bit, you know, one of the uh, other conclusions, which was a, a much lower uh, emissions growth after 2020. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was, uh, the other question, at least so, someone like, like I have been dealing with because of, as you, uh, when we met, at, when I was at the IEA, my job was to try to bring China closer mm -hmm. into the IEA and I don't, with very limited success. <laughs> I, I, I have to be completely, uh, you know, forthcoming in that. But, but I, I think your comments at the end were that China wants to cooperate, but certainly full membership is not in the cards, but through a variety of either bilateral and multilateral, and especially an enhanced role in APEC, which I think up to now, I think China has played a relatively moderate role in, within APEC in the energy. That's my impression, but I'll certainly defer to others, and, and uh, then you, you, uh, you see that working its way through other bilaterals, or multilaterals, uh, G20, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the IEA. But you didn't mention IEF, I, I was mm -hmm. interested in that. Yeah. So, yeah. so those are my kind of observations that what struck me is, uh, is and I, I think it's an interesting way to approach it, is to take your perspective on many of these key assumptions that the IEA and others have made about China. My, I guess I, I'll have one question because I know there's a lot of other questions, is how, I mean, I, I know there's a five-year plan out now and that's got some very ambitious aspirational goals on renewables and non, uh, fossil. other non-fossil fuels as well as reducing 
coal and has a expansion of nuclear that you have in yours. But how, uh, how influential do you think your recommendations, I mean, will be in terms of actually getting the kind of uh, policy changes and the investments that will need to be made by the key players in China, including your former employer, CNBC, on, on some of these. Um, obviously, you, you must think they're, they're very, there's a very good chance that many of these policy recommendations will be implemented. But I just wanted to leave you with that open-ended question before uh, opening up to the, uh, to the audience. How, yeah. how do you see this playing through the policy process in, uh, in China? I think now is uh, energy policy is really under uh, research and uh, reviewed, and actually, uh, and five years plan for energy is very much for for these five years very much delayed. Uh, actually, it's released last year. Mm -hmm. This five year actually started in the 2011, 2011 to the 2015, but uh, the five years plan just released uh, last year. Means what? Means very complicated. <laughs> Means uh, uh, still a lot of things and uncertainties cannot be clearly identified and positioned. So the strategy and the policy cannot be generated accordingly. So this is a very complicated issue. Now, because the change of the people, change of the organization, this is gradually getting ready. Uh, most important things is uh, is uh, uh, several factors. One is uh, we we call the uh, invisible hand. That is the market, market forces. Another is policy. That means the, the, the visible hand. You know which one should be play uh, important role, cri uh, critical role. For many years, actually, policy play a very critical role. This is, uh, can be explained some development. For example, wind energy growing very fast, right? This is simply because it's strongly supported by the policy. So the, the subsector like, uh, like uh, solar and the wind almost over-invested. You know, capacity is over. So this is uh, issues. Now, uh, under the new leadership, under the very serious, intense debate on the issues and some other similar things, we realize the market should play a baseline low, <laughs> basic low, should be base, you know. And the uh, government should be in some degree to, to, to uh, deregulate it. So now some approval, some rights uh, previous enjoyed you know, hold by the, the government agency now is almost, you know, to relax, uh, deregulated. For example, ANG uh, uh, approval for ANG plants not subject to the, the, the central planners. Local planner can be play important role, and they have final words almost. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, so you. this is the things is changing greatly. Yeah. Well, that's very helpful because, I, we, you know, as we all know, mm -hmm. Uh, price reform in many of the sectors has mm -hmm. got to play a critical role mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in it, if the market's going to play mm -hmm. a bigger role in allocating. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, market will be played alone and uh, and uh, located relocated the all resources. Yeah. So it puts the market first. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let, let me open up. Uh, I think the woman in the blue was this was the first one to put up her hands. Well. You, didn't, um, you did not stress Russia very much, but do you expect that there will be a gas deal between uh, Russia and China this year? Hopefully, and uh, <laughs> we, we very much are looking for that, you know. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the slide, other than the going to detail, actually uh, domestic supply of gas will be increased, but not enough. We need to, uh, to, to introduce, to import uh, uh, sizable, you know, uh, a huge number of the gas from neighboring countries. 
we really enjoyed a very successful gas shipment from Turkmenistan. But for many years, we have negotiated with Russia for many, many years, haven't uh, you know, finalized the yes, simply because the, because the, the different uh, uh, thinking, different uh, formula or gas pricing formulas. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I know, the gap is quite narrowed down now, mm -hmm. quite narrowed down. We both sides realized this, uh, how to understand uh, the gas supply in Russia. For example, especially taking into account of the, the, the shell revolution in US. And also for Russia, they have to better understand China as well as part of Asia. Now we're facing uh, multiple competitions. As I mentioned, sales competitions come in the year 20, uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. So if Russia cannot catch up, the opportunity may be gone. <laughs> we have multiple sources available for China now. So I believe the both sides very much forced to, to narrow its uh, uh, gap. Thank you. Uh. Yeah, Julia knows the rules here, so she actually identified herself in affiliation. I forgot to mention everyone. Please do that. And uh, other comment on the Ch China, Russia, having just been in Japan talking about gas and mm -hmm. in the region, uh, the fact that China has provided some capital up front as part of this negotiation, yeah, yeah. I think, is very useful for a Russians' ability to develop some of that East Siberian gas. So, mm -hmm. I agree. Very important, though, yeah. The, the woman uh, right in front of uh, Julia there. Thanks so much, Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire. Thanks for doing this today. Um, I'm wondering, China, like all countries, is supposed to be developing new greenhouse gas targets now. Um, this they're supposed to be unveiled next year latest by March or so as part of this process to develop a new, I don't know, treaty, whatever it's going to be, a new new global agreement on climate change. Um, I'm wondering, well, first, any insights that you have into this process, but also from, from what you've studied, what is, what do you see as likely? What will China, do you think, be able to put on the table after this intensity target, after its current 40 to 45 percent intensity target is is met, um, you know, is an absolute emissions reduction on on the table? Is it something less than that at this point? Thanks. What's the specific, what's the specific questions? Is the greenhouse gas emissions targets, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what, what would the, uh, yeah, <laughs> what do you think the Chinese will do in terms of uh, whether it's, uh, the next uh, IPCC mm -hmm. meetings, or, or, or what? Sorry, what's I'm the, forget the context, but I mean, China is supposed to be developing new targets. Mm -hmm. What is China ready to do? Uh, we currently have an energy intensity, or pardon me, a carbon intensity target. Is China ready, do you think, for an absolute emissions reduction target? I think the China is very ready, especially at this moment, if we consider the air pollution here in China, right? The Beijing and the most part of Eastern China is covered by the atmosphere pollution very seriously. For example, the day before I'm coming here, PM 2.5, almost 500, compared with three or five in Canada. So it's a... It's a very serious pollution we witnessed in Beijing, mm -hmm. in China. So I think now the country have to be serious about the issues, and we have seen some action have been taken already. For example, there is a plan we I changed it this way: a plan for actions against the atmosphere uh, pollution. This plan released last year. They targeting. Uh, they targeting co uh, co consumption reduction should be down to 65 percent in the year 2017. This is a plan they, 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 they made for the country. For Beijing, particularly, they try to curb the co consumption should reduce to the same percentage, 65 percent, but not in the year 2017 but in the year 2015, two years earlier. 
they mean reflect they are very high pressures to, to, to dealing with these issues. And in the generally, uh, the Energy Bureau just concluded their national meeting. They would like to such target should be done by this year, by this year. So this is a very high pressure is already there. And this country should be taken uh, uh, all measures, you know, mm -hmm. anything they can to reduce the coal consumption. And a big measure will be, will be happen, will be taking place. We just look. If we can we take see. Uh, two questions, one right after the other, so we can get more in, then uh, Shu can answer them both. Uh, first, the woman in the. Okay, sorry. Hello, please. My, please. my name is Eric Sander. I'm with the Department of Energy. And I'd like to know something about the status of the uh, Chinese methane hydrate program. Have you uh, surveyed the East and South China Sea? And uh, also, have you extracted any hydrates from the floor of the ocean yet? And the woman behind the, we'll, we'll do two questions. So we can maybe get more questions in that way. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Seguero's International Group. Thank you for your, your presentation. I come from Kenya, uh, from Africa. What uh, relationship uh, uh, business relationship do you think when it comes to energy and gas with Africa and what policy would you put in place looking at that relationship now that Africa is coming up with with energy solar and gas what would be the relationship and the policy to other looking at corruption transparency of uh, the oil and gas in Africa thank you, so you yeah, this is, uh, this is Africa. a big issue. I like this issue. It actually is a, a sign of African relations in, uh, in energy sector, for example, which is very, I'm very focused on. I have uh, independent research on these issues. Uh, I believe uh, such a cooperation with strengthen in, in, in early France, uh, including energy. Energy may, may well take a lead. Uh, for example, uh, oil, for example, China coming to Africa for our resources. But uh, uh, the, we account the different many things, you know, accountability, transparency issues, you know. These things is quite a new for us, you know. Uh, when, especially when I'm working uh, at CMPC. As an oil company, we were coming to uh, our destinations to, to build the oil industry. We, our module may seem different from Westerns. Because we build the industry from upstream, midstream, and downstream, we take an integrated way to build the oil industry. So then, before it's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, separated, it's a very successful example. But uh, the things we, in, we, we witnessed, we, we encountered in Africa, much more uh, uh, go beyond the, of companies. It's imagine because the company very, not very familiar with such environment issues, but now really they get educated. They find the how, how to deal with such issues. Number one thing is social responsibility. These things should be taken very seriously. Uh, for many years, social responsibility issues only taken as some simply list a report, what I have done you know, uh, for the society something like charity issues. Now, I, as I talk with my former colleagues, uh, social responsibility is not a charity issues. We should take it very seriously. Similar like uh, I, uh, HSE, it is the healthy safety and the environment. This is a corporate system. We should be serious about that, to build the system inside the company. So I believe social responsibility will be to in the same way like uh, HSE. This is something a uh, company can do. And uh, also beyond the company, I believe the, the country, the, the, the government have getting ready how to deal with uh, this sort of country or in, in Africa. This is very much a serious issue, not only uh, energy issue, but uh, political issue, diplomatic issue as well. I think the, the relation is moving to a right way. The such cooperation will be strengthened. Will be strengthened. Mm -hmm. mm. 
I have done some cooperative research on the issues. You know, one is shell experience in Nigeria. Another case, CMPC in in Sudan. If we compare the two modules, we will conclude there's something different. Yeah. <laughs> You're learning from experience, huh? <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, your issue is uh, hydro in the marine, uh, in, for example, uh, South China Sea. I'm not very focused on South China Sea or the marine uh, uh, issues there, but uh, South China Sea is a very important place. There's a lot of debate, your political issues over there. First of all, back to resources. Uh, I don't think there is a very strong research or survey, geological survey over uh, that period, that, that places. So everybody, when I can kind of research, the resource, the information is very separated. There's no authoritative uh, research to, to support some comprehensive research. And uh, secondly, you mentioned hydrate. Hydrate is a new energy source, actually. It's the future of the energy. Uh, very recently, there is a team, as I know from the media, uh, a team, international team led by Chinese uh, sciences just concludes uh, geological activities in South China Sea. This is the very first uh, activity, first things of there uh, conducted by international team led by Chinese sciences. So it's very uh, this is the place early. I believe there is some potential in South China Sea. But at the same time, uh, hydro actually some other places, for example, Tibetan, there are some rich in hydro as well, hydro as well. Okay. But it's so quite take time. This unconventional will be, be not become reality. Ed Chow, and then uh, in the back. Uh, well, maybe yeah, we'll start there since. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Honored guest first. <laughs> Chris Flavin with World Watch Institute. There's been a, a dramatic, unexpected five-fold increase in the domestic solar power market in China in the last year. And you combine that with the fact that you, you already are far and away the dominant uh, producer of so solar modules and have helped drive down the global price of those modules by 75% in the last uh, four years. I mean, these are sort of extraordinary developments. And interestingly, they're driven by a part of the energy economy, a, a small part of the energy economy, which actually is in the competitive private sector, you know, unlike most of the energy industry, uh, which, is, which is in the state owned uh, sector. So I'd be interested in your view in terms of what this portends uh, for, for future developments. I mean, if you can have a five-fold increase in, in one year, um, I think that would potentially blow away all of your projections for 2020. Yeah, in terms of solar, right? Solar, so far, the solar production output is very little compared with wind and, uh, you know, hydro uh, in terms of uh, uh, the power generation is very, the size is very small actually in terms of the, the number. But I, we forecast the, the growth into the future for the solar will be very fast. My number may be the over 100%, 140, I believe. They will be, because encouraged by the policy. As I mentioned, as a renewable, we believe the hydro will be increased steadily, but not in look like this way, you know, increase sharply. The wind and the solar will be uh, two fourths uh, after the, the hydro. So wind will take the lead first of all and followed by the solar. Uh, why solar will be increased so fast? Because it's encouraged by policy and uh, small size now. And also we realize the solar sector should be supported, should be open for the private competition, mm -hmm. not dominated. Because we need to, uh, to develop this uh, solar sector you know, in some uh, local region much required by the local, local communities. And why is solar and wind growing so much faster than nuclear in your projections? 
nuclear is a very specific issue. I believe nuclear will be, as a close of the nuclear will be resumed under very strict safety conditions. But the growth will be coming up. Uh, but solar is quite different from, from nuclear anyway, you know. Uh, it can be, can be open can for, for private competition. And already some pri private company actually take a lead, actually. Take a very critical, important role in, 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 in solar sector. Large companies, state-owned companies, they only have small, 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 small share in, in, in solar sector. That's leave a big room for private company to grow up. Okay. Uh, Ed Chow, then uh, we'll take a couple more together after Ed. Um, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Xu, for a very, very rich and comprehensive um, uh, presentation. Uh, your report will no doubt generate many, many days of study by, by uh, some of us, uh, uh, and it will generate a lot of questions, but I will limit myself to just one. Uh, your forecast, as with other Chinese forecasts I've seen, uh, suggests that imported gas beyond 2020 will be more or less flat. Very little growth in imported gas after 2020. Um, I guess it, it, that generates two types of questions. One is, if you want to sell to China, you better sell gas to China now and not wait until later. Uh, but a lot of the assumptions on uh, tight gas, CBM growth, and so on, will require pretty difficult uh, structural reform in, in China. I guess my question is, if those uh, unconventional gas uh, production targets are not met, what would China do then? Would it then continue to increase uh, gas imports, either pipeline gas uh, or, or LNG, or would it turn to other energy sources to fill the gap? Yes, you mentioned very important issues for the first uh, reform, no matter economic reform, corporate reform, pricing reform. Reform is very much required now, you know, uh, especially for, for gas. As I mentioned, the gas, the future of the gas is very much promoted by unconventional, not a conventional. Conventional will be going like this, unconventional going up. So, but the unconventional is different sector of, different sector deforms, different from the conventional. Similar like uh, oil and gas. Gas is not similar to the similar sector like, like oil. Conventional, even as uh, by nature is the same, is a natural gas, but the unconventional, Will be should be developed under different framework, different systems. This is the issue. We should have a better understanding of the unconventional. Now we should make a system ready. Now it's not very uh, everything in place. This is a reality. We we need to know. So reform is required. It should be places. If such reform were failed, I think we should think uh, otherwise, differently. Absolutely. Because the gap still is there for, for natural gas, so the input will be in increased, will be increased. This is the things very f uh, uh, answer your questions about the reform. Yes, back to the growth change for, for natural gas. Yes, we see uh, the growth will be obvious before the 2020 and the little left off af thereafter, simply because now we have several projects working on domestically and internationally. Uh, internationally speaking, especially uh, is enabling you know, relations with Central Asia, for example. We probably will double our import from Central Asia, especially Turkmenistan, plus some additional source of gas from Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Kazakhstan. So the total amount of the gas import to China will be double. So this is, will be increase our supply very sharply. Thank you. Oh, maybe we get, we're running, uh, we started late, so maybe we can run a little bit over. Maybe we take uh, in the back that, uh, yes, you and young lady here, and then the third one there, take three questions, and then ask you to answer three of them. Uh, Consecutively. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Hira Kutsu. Um, I'm a 
a distinct scholar from Japan here at CSIS. Uh, I'm interested in your policy recommendations, especially the second one, to find uh, uh, the best uh, uh, mix uh, for uh, energy uh, resources. Uh, I'm curious to know whether you have done any study to find the, the best or optimal uh, mixture uh, from China's perspective, uh, rather than forecasting the future energy uh, consumption. Thank you. What chance? Or, uh, no? No, she, okay, I see. Hi, um, I'm Ayaga Jones from Energy Information Administration. And I, if I remember correct, uh, one of the assumptions you made, actually the first, very first one you talk about is the 20, 20, and by 2020, clean coal technology uh, is widespread in, in China, and along with coal to gas switching. And you also talk about the carbon capture and storage being one of the five technologies prioritized. Uh, if I understand correctly, these are the, your uh, assumptions. I'm just wondering if you could um, define for us uh, how, you, uh, how you define the clean coal technology in your projection. Do you mean uh, carbon capture and storage or just a high efficiency steam turbines and so ultra super critical coal plants or the you know, combination of both? And uh, also, can you give us an update on the carbon capture and storage development in China and in terms of uh, uh, policy support and uh, support from the senior government officials or project updates? What, one final in this group, then we'll ask you to answer those three. Edward Delman, Center for New American Security. You mentioned in the report that you see offshore production building up. I think somewhere around 2018. Um, how do you see that sort of production building up specifically in the East China Sea and South China Sea regions? And how do you see production there affecting the security situation in both regions? Or conversely, do you see production there maybe helping strengthen bilateral relationships or multilateral relationships with ASEAN or with neighboring countries who are also heavy energy importers? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Best mixture, Three. clean coal and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, clean coal, CCS, and uh, energy mix. What's the... I haven't... Uh, uh, I forgot the first question about energy mix. You... What's the best... Oh, best... Uh, mm. Best uh, or the optimum mm -hmm. energy mix for China? Mm -hmm. The best one, uh, from my view, actually, I believe is uh, the, the energy mix in the year 2035. That is the best one, the, simply because coal reduced to below the 50. Means the coal still will play important role because of Chinese reality, the huge coal resources. Coal will be play a major role, but not at the high rate like today's, you know, 70%. Leaves no room for other source of energy to play, to, to, to grow up, you know simply because the coal is so dirty, you know. So there's no technology followed up to make the, the coal cleaner. Such technology very much required, but the cost is high as well. So the best solution, I believe, simply reduce the coal cons consumption, reduce its percentage. This is the best way. So the e easy way to, to, to optimize the energy mix. So the, the level, best level, should be below 50% and increase natural gas to the 40%, similar to gas. And then renewable should be a 24%. Such a structure should be a workable, look nice to China. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Could maybe clean coal fits clean in with that. Uh, yeah, clean coal, this is very lim uh, related issue, actually. Uh, clean coal is another way, another solution to how to make the coal cleaner, right? We cannot li live without the coal anyway, right? So the right things we are working on now, I would like to mention, is coal to gas project. This is something we're working on uh, heavily now. Uh, for a few years ago, such a project is very limited by the policy. Now, leave it open. Um, 
government encourage local authorities to 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 develop the coal to gas mm -hmm. uh, uh, project. Now have several uh, projects, pilot projects going on. I believe this is may be a way to test which tech technology and the solution will be worked out to make the coal cleaner. Because now such a, a business approach still costs much, especially uh, coal itself and uh, water as well. We calculate uh, like this, you know, uh, about the cost. One cubic meat may cost three times of coal, 10 times of water. So this is not affordable. So the, the, the solution is good, but we need to fix it up, you know, make it cost effective way. So another thing, the CCS, of course, CCS, is important. Yeah. CCS now are still not fully developed, generally speaking, not fully developed. Some, some debate still is going on, is CCS or CCU utilization, you know, which one is the best? There's some debate on the issues. As I mentioned on my slide here, I list 10 technologies, including CCS. But we just counted, uh, take into account, but not very really assessed in detail. These things we will continue to working on. And, and the last thing is uh, South uh, sure, of South China Sea, East China Sea, South China Sea production or resource development and its relations with security. Uh, this is things, something like a chicken and egg, you know. Um, I believe some security framework is a precondition. It's pretty much so, as we realized. Previously speaking, for the authorities, for the leader uh, of China, they would like to have economic cooperation, try to put the economic cooperation first, and we will benefit them, followed by some political cooperation. It seems not simply put this way, and accepted by the different uh, uh, countries, you know, neighboring countries. I believe some type of security arrangements is must, is a precondition for some uh, a specific cooperation. Without uh, uh, arrangements, security arrangements, there's nothing could be happen. Even we have some some try, some some drilling, you know, uh, in South China Sea and the East China Sea, but it, it is only attempts, political attempts, mean nothing economically. So now we have to take a realistic attitude to the issues. Uh, one thing we we should have things to discuss already now. Uh, first of all, we take South China Sea for example. Taiwan and mainland China should be closely working together on the issues. And then we should to work with neighboring countries bilaterally. So these things should be uh, focused on. Uh, something we realized, some mechanisms should be set up. Is there one final? I saw a hand over here. Is it, uh, yes. Uh, gentlemen, take that the final question. Thank you very much, Mr. Xu. My name is Paul McGuire from the Capital Research Center. Um, earlier, you discussed about how China has has great immense has immense reserves of shale gas. If I'm correct, but currently there are problems in developing them over the long term. I simply wanted to ask to ask for a possible elaboration, especially in which regions of China in particular have potential with shale gas? China has actually, um, shale gas, shale formation is uh, uh, um, placed in, in the, across the country actually. Now uh, 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 existing resources uh, uh, very much concentrated in the uh, southwest, in Sichuan Basin. This is a place very much focused on, was heavily invested by the Chinese company. And the uh, foreign company uh, is a close look at, and some company like Shell working with CMPC uh, in uh, several projects in, in, in Sichuan as well. I, last year, I visited 
the, the size and the, the both working very well because Shell has a huge experience in, in, in US. They can ship their exp experience to, to China, but they realize different, different structure, different packaging should be tailored in China. So the uh, opportunity is there. I believe the opportunity may, will be available in, 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 in wide uh, in manner as uh, compared to uh, last year. Simply because now uh, we and some experts realized uh, uh, there's some mistakes I would like to say, you know, uh, we learned something from, from U.S. that, you know, shale gas should, uh, actually shale gas is very much open to the uh, private company. Private company play a key role in U.S., right? China should be did the thing, did the thing. But now we think it, in China, there's no similar type of meeting, small and meeting private company in U.S. Yeah. So we now may may encourage the major, big company play a big role. So they take a lead. And uh, some private company, small company can follow, working together with big company. In this framework, foreign company can provide some service. So service industry will be open, will be the place, will be area for, for cooperation into the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me in, uh, well, in thanking you.